Good evening for our midweek Lenten sermon series, looking at the table of duties in Martin Luther's small catechism, section three of his small catechism. So we, we find there in the table of duties, different vocations, stations in life, and scripture passages that speak to the responsibilities, the duties, those for those different uh, vocations. Tonight, we look at husbands and wives, and we have our scripture readings there from Ephesians chapter five, and Jesus's words about marriage, uh, some of his words about marriage in Matthew 19. You should have an outline of the order of service here, and also a white half sheet that has the series hymn on that. That uh, hymn was written by Matthew uh, Richard, a pastor that I encountered in my, out in uh, Southern California. And uh, the uh, hymn, it uh, follows the different table of duties there and the different vocations. Then you'll also find the psalm for the psalmody on the back of that half sheet, that white half sheet, Psalm 25 which we will recite responsibly, whole verse by whole verse. Let us begin now with the opening hymn. Please stand.
The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of your day. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. Mighty and merciful Lord. to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own most fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting the Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. Amen. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. For they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. Please be seated for the office hymn.
wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Remain seated for the gospel reading. The gospel reading from St. Matthew, the 19th chapter. He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I come and my spirit. Into your hands I come and my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Into your hands I come and my spirit. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. The word of our Lord for our sermon this evening is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the fifth chapter, as we heard it read a short while ago, especially verse 32. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church, the mystery of of the two becoming one flesh in holy matrimony. Tonight, we begin our midweek Lenten sermon series on Martin Luther's table of duties as they are laid out in section three of Martin Luther's small catechism. I invite each of you then for just a short moment here to open your copy of Lutheran service book in front of you and turn to page 328. Page 328 is where we find section 3 of Luther's small catechism printed here in Lutheran service book. As we talked about last week, section 1 
It consists of the six chief parts. And then in section two, we find the daily prayers, prayers for morning and evening, mealtime prayers. Section four, Christian questions with their answers as a guide to prepare for Holy Communion. And then in section three, the table of duties, passages of scripture for various holy orders and positions, admonishing them about their duties and responsibilities. And so we find here in this table that it's arranged according to different vocations, different callings, different stations in life that God has given each individual Christian. Each vocation calling that we find here can be categorized under the following three spheres or areas of life, the church and the household or the home and civil society. Throughout our Lenten midweek sermon series, we will consider the duties and responsibilities then of husband and wife and parents and children, employers and employees, youth and widows. Tonight, we consider the duties and responsibilities then of husband and wife, according to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through, 20 through 33. And if you'd like, you can set your Lutheran service book down or keep it with you, whichever you prefer. I'd like to say that it's important to keep in mind at the outset that when we speak of duties or responsibilities, Theologically, we're speaking of God's law. We're speaking about what God expects of us. In terms of duties and responsibilities of the husband and the wife, St. Paul clearly lays out the expectations then. He lays them out when he writes to the Ephesian Christians, also in other places, in other letters, but we find them here, the Ephesian Christians, and he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And then husbands, love your wives. And then let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. These are St. Paul's words in his letter to the Ephesians regarding then the duties and responsibilities of husband and wife. Divinely inspired words that still apply to the church today. They didn't just apply culturally to that time or to the Ephesian Christians. They are God's inspired words still apply to the church today. Words that are based, based in God's plan for man and woman from the beginning of creation prior to the fall of mankind, the beginning of creation, as we see that plan laid out in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. As St. Paul and as Jesus in our gospel reading then quote Genesis 2, 24 regarding marriage. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So these words about marriage, of course, they're God's inspired words, but we know, we know that they have not always been received well, especially that submission language, right? Submission language that might make especially those outside of the church in the broader culture really cringe and raise their hackles. The language of submission has become almost like a kind of dirty word in our world. It's become synonymous with oppression and a domineering kind of posture and attitude. Although the concept of submission in Ephesians has been exploited in some situations, and certainly there have been negative examples throughout history, although those things have been the case, Paul has in mind here, when he writes to the Ephesian Christians, a kind of joyful, a kind of godly submission or ordering that is based in the love and the forgiveness of God in Jesus. And it is based in God's holy plan for man and woman from creation. There's absolutely then no place in Paul's letters or in Paul's theology or in the Bible for this oppressive, domineering understanding of submission between husband and a wife. 
Paul first assumes that both husband and wife as part of God's church are submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ as members of the church. And one could even make the point that the greater emphasis there in Ephesians is on the man, the man loving the wife. So what a picture of marriage, what a plan, what duties, what responsibilities, what obligations. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Let each of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And at times, it can seem like such an unbearable weight and load. Can it not? If you're like me, you read this description of a husband and a wife, God's plan for marriage, the expectations. You might immediately feel the pressure, feel that sense of inadequacy, imperfection. You might immediately think about those times when you have failed when you've not fulfilled these duties and responsibilities. And you might then think about the times that you have not loved and not comforted and not honored your spouse as you ought, times when you have quite simply been more of a burden, when you've bickered and nitpicked and coerced. That is to say, St. Paul's words here about the duties of husband and wife might quickly leave us feeling isolated, alone, left as if staring in a mirror at our own sin, our own blemishes. These words may leave us in that state, quite frankly, whether one is married or not, whether one is single. And yet alone, alone with our sin and blemishes is most certainly not the picture of marriage that Paul gives in his letter to the Ephesian Christians. It's not the picture of marriage that Jesus upholds in our gospel reading. And it's not the picture of marriage that we are given in Genesis from the time of creation. When God first created Adam, what did he say? It's not right for him to be alone. And so he made a helper fit for him from his very own flesh. And that's how Paul proclaims marriage. He speaks about marriage by speaking about Jesus and his love for the church. Christ, who shares our flesh and blood and is one with us as our helper, as our Savior, the husband of the church, for the church of which you and I are called to belong by the Holy Spirit, the church for which Jesus gave himself up that he might sanctify her and make her holy, the church that he cleansed by the washing of the water and the word. The husband then is not alone. The wife is not alone. The Christian married couple is not alone. They always have union with Jesus as part of his church, his bride. So this means that husband, wife, and the Christian married couple is not left alone to carry out these God-given responsibilities these duties. And this means that husband and wife, the Christian married couple, is not left alone with their inadequacies, with their shortcomings, with their imperfections, their failures, their marriage sins. When husband and wife fail as husband and wife, Jesus takes failures. He takes failures away and gives his forgiveness instead. The very blood that dripped from his wounds on the cross is the blood that heals all wounds, including marriage wounds. And he comforts, and he honors, and he loves in sickness and in health until death parts and we are received with him in the marriage feast of heaven. And the beautiful part of this is that Jesus, of course, does this for every member of his church, whether married or single. 
as members of his church, married or single or even divorced, you are joined to Jesus, part of his body, one flesh with him, his bride. He loves his own. Paul clearly and he emphatically proclaims the duties then of husband and wife in marriage through this metaphor of Jesus and the church. It's then as members of the church, Jesus' very own body, the body of Christ, that Paul can say to the wife that she is to submit to her husband as both submit to Christ and belong to his body. It's on the basis of Christ and his self-sacrificial love for the church that Paul can exhort husbands to love their wives in a similar self-sacrificing way with the very love of Jesus. It's on the basis of Christ and his union with the church that Paul can say husband and wife also are united in a mysterious way. As the scriptures say, the man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two, the two shall become one flesh. It's on this basis, the basis of this union and love between Christ and the church, that Paul can finally exhort husbands to love their wives and wives to respect and honor their husbands. For Paul, It's not ultimately about the husband and the wife, but it's about Jesus and the church. The husband and the wife have value. Every member of the church, for that matter, has value in the fact that their most important identity is as a baptized, forgiven child of God, a member of the body of Christ in union with him, Christ the head of the church, and his love and forgiveness that binds the church together and sustains it through all joys and all challenges and all trials in life. It's this love, this love of Christ for the church that binds Christian marriages together and sustains them. A love that, as Paul says in another letter to the Corinthians, the 13th chapter, A love that's not self-seeking. A love that keeps no record of wrongs. A love that forgives wrong as Christ first forgave. A love that is only found in Jesus where he offers himself in love for the church and his holy word and in his sacraments. Amen. Peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let us continue now with the prayers. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. In righteousness I shall see you. When I awake, your presence will give me joy. Be present, merciful God, and protect us through the hours of this night so that we who are wearied by the changes and chance of life may find our rest in you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gracious Lord, we pray that you would be with our homebound members, homebound members of this congregation, Nancy and Ruth. We pray also for Bill and John and Joey, Joyce and the Matro family. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Abide with us, Lord, for it is toward evening and the day is far spent. Abide with us and with your whole church. Abide with us at the end of the day 
at the end of our life, at the end of the world. Abide with us with your grace and goodness, with your holy word and sacrament, with your strength and blessing. Abide with us when the night of affliction and temptation comes upon us, the night of fear and despair, the night when death draws near. Abide with us and with all the faithful now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Guide us, waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. The Almighty and Merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you. Amen. Please be seated for the closing hymn. 